As you can see, this series is all about cooking wonderful and juicy meats just like this. And to continue our series, today I'm going to be using the cheapest grill I can find to cook some amazing foods with it. Some of them turned out fantastic, others not so much. But in the end, it's all about how it's going to taste. This is I cooked every meat with the cheapest grill I can find, so let's do it. So my search began by going to Amazon.com. Then I typed up charcoal grill cheap exclamation point. $109? Even though that's a good deal, but no. $54? Hmm, that's not bad. So after searching for a while with many different prices, I was able to find this one. It costs $34.99. Looks like I'll be able to control the airflow, so that means that I can control the temperature. So I went ahead and bought it. After putting it together, this is what it looks like. I mean, it's nothing fancy, what did you expect? But I can't control the air vents. As I take the lid off, you can see there are two grates. One is to hold the charcoal and the other one for the food. I can immediately tell that the air vents are gonna get hot, so my finger is gonna go nowhere near that. Same goes with the bottom air vent. This thing will get hot, so I better use some tongues. And the overall quality of this thing is terrible. Look at this, it's all banged up. It has some holes for no reason. And the handle is made out of plastic, come on. Look at how thin the metal is. I'm talking about thin. Even the tip of my pen is thicker than this. I'm gonna be using the best charcoal I have and I think this thing is just gonna melt. But there's only one way to find out and that's to put it to its test. I'll be using two methods to cook. One is gonna be direct heat which I use it for grilling. That means a lot of charcoal and a lot of intense heat. The second way will be indirect heat where the heat is not so much but I can control the temperature. Now you're probably asking how in the world are you gonna control the temperature with this and know what temperature it is? Well first I'll be using the air vents as you already know and the other one comes with experience. But even though I have experience I am no magic genie. So from time to time I'll be using my laser thermometer. That will allow me to take the internal temperature of the cooker. But now that you got familiar with this terrible cheap grill it's time to get cooking. And the very first one we're gonna start off with is gonna be a beautiful bony and ribeye which will be juicy, tender and absolutely delicious. And here we have it raw. As you can see, this one is an inch and a half thick. It also has wonderful marbling, which is exactly what you're looking for whenever you're choosing steaks. Now talking about that marbling, what happens is when you grill a steak like this, normally it falls apart. To ensure that does not happen, I'll be dressing it with butcher's twine. That at least will be keeping it together when we're doing the sear, which is one of the most critical part. To season it, as always, with a beautiful piece like this, you don't want to mask the flavor. I just went with salt, freshly ground black pepper, and garlic powder. As always, make sure you season both sides. For additional flavor on this beautiful steak, I'll be using thyme, garlic, and butter. We all know that this combination is perfect for a wonderful steak like this. But now that our steak is ready, it's time to get grilling. So I threw in a whole chimney of charcoal in there. And do not forget, every time you get a new grill, you must do the first burn out. That is because the factory puts some chemicals which you must get rid of. So after letting everything burn for a while and you can tell that the smell is off when it first comes out. I would say about after 15 minutes, it was ready. So I first started by melting my butter, thyme and garlic. This is perfect because I'll be basting my steak with it. Once that was done, I threw in my steak. Because I know this charcoal very well, I knew it was gonna get a quick sear. And after one minute and a half, I did the first flip and look at that. That's what I'm talking about. Right after that, I started searing the other side for two minutes. Once the time was up, I lifted up and this is what I got. That is looking wonderful, my friends. Extremely promising and I can't wait to find out how it's gonna taste. Of course, to finish it up, I started by basting it. Now you have to remember, since this is butter, once you turn it, it will flare up. As you can see, that's exactly what happened. So you don't want your steak to burn, make sure you move it around. But after grilling for a total of six minutes, I was left with a beautiful ribeye steak cooked on the cheapest grill ever. And if you could only smell how wonderful it smells, you will be wanting to take a bite just like I am. But of course, I can't wait to find out the actual results. So I went in for my first slice. And as I did, you can see that that is perfection. Perfectly medium rare, just the way I like it. I think I can actually cook a lot of things on this grill. That is a wonderful looking steak. But as always, the most important thing is how is it gonna taste. And as you can see from this piece, I can tell that it's nice, juicy and also very tender. And for today, I was lucky enough to have my nephew with me. As you can tell from all of that, this grill actually did its job. Now that I found out that it actually cooks the steaks, let's see what else I can cook with it. And by the way, if you think we threw the bone away, you see this part right here guys? This is the best part. This part right here is the best part. Yeah, we know and you ate all of it. Didn't even leave me a piece. You know what? I'm gonna eat a little bit of the rest of this. <laughs> now a cheap grill deserves a cheap meat. 
So I am going to be making the most wonderful meatloaf you've ever seen. And even though this one is cheap, it is gonna be good. I started by cooking some bacon. As always, you wanna start in low heat. This will allow the bacon fat to render slowly without burning it. And as you can tell, I am using the center cut which has less fat. Once it was fully cooked, I removed it from the pan. For this recipe, you do not want your bacon crispy. Just make sure it's cooked all the way through just like this. Using the exact pan, I threw in some bacon fat. I'm using purple onion but feel free to use anyone you like. Start by cooking the onions and make sure you deglaze the pan. And to do that, I'm using Chinese cooking wine. But any white wine will work just fine. Once the onions are fully cooked, throw back in the bacon and mix it well. Make sure you combine all of them together and reserve. The secret is to let them completely cool down. Now I recommend using a loaf pan, it makes the job a lot easier. Now if you don't have a silicone pan like mine, you definitely want to use clinch plastic. But as you can see, mine is completely flexible and nothing will stick to it. For the meatloaf, it's pretty easy. I started one pound of ground beef, which is 80-20, followed by the bacon mix we just made, one cup of provolone cheese, two whole eggs, two tablespoons of brown sugar, one teaspoon of salt, and half a teaspoon of black pepper. Now you want to mix it really good to make sure everything is combined. Once that's done, your meatloaf is almost ready. Using the pan loaf, make sure you pack everything tightly. Try to avoid as many air gaps as possible. But at the same time, with my experience, you can almost never take all of them out unless you use a vacuum chamber but that's for a different episode as you can see by the time I was done this is what it looks like now to make sure you keep its shape while cooking I like to freeze it the very next day as you can see it's a hundred percent frozen and because I use the silicone mat it easily comes out and just like I told you it is almost impossible to remove all of the air gaps now since we have bacon inside let's also put it in the outside so for that I like to cover the whole thing with bacon because we all know bacon makes everything better to make sure this is not gonna fall apart on me I decided to use a little bit of parchment paper this will allow me to put it in and off the grill very easily talking about grill I set it to indirect heat my goal was for it to reach 165 degrees Fahrenheit internally and as far as the cooker goes I try to keep it at 375 degrees Fahrenheit threw in my meatloaf covered it up and let it cook and after an hour and a half this is what I was left with that is a meatloaf cooked to 165 degrees Fahrenheit internally and as you can see the bacon is perfectly cooked Cooked. But now I'm wondering what the inside is gonna look like. So I went ahead and took in my first slice and look at that. It looks very good to me. What do you think? Oof, we got some cheese going out and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. As I continue slicing them up, you can see them they are as juicy as it gets. That is looking like a very promising meatloaf. But as always, the most important thing is always the taste. And as you can see from this piece, it looks like everything was cooked perfectly. And my nephew Angel was here for us to try it out together. That bacon is fire. That thing is amazing, everybody. This bacon here got some nice, beautiful flavor. Absolutely incredible. You guys gotta try this one. This one's good. And cooking it on that little thing actually worked. Can't believe it. I'm telling you, friends, this is something you definitely gotta try. And even if you don't have a chip grill, just do it anywhere because I'm sure you will love this one. If there's one thing I love is baby back ribs. And to cook wonderful ribs like this on that chip grill is gonna be extremely challenging. Because if there's one thing I like is fall off the bone ribs. There is nothing better than that. Even though some people consider overcooked, I just think that's the way ribs should always be. And of course, I started with a full rack of baby back ribs. And this one is thick. Dick. Usually it comes with a membrane in the back and you just gotta pull it out. But as you can see, this one has none. So that makes my job a lot easier. Now as you already know, there's no way that this is gonna fit on that grill. So here's how I decided to butcher it. I started by cutting the first piece off. Then I completely removed one bone, skipped another, and went to the edge of the following one right away. And this is what I was left with. As you can see, I'm able to maximize the most amount of meat with just one bone. This does two things. It will allow the ribs to cook faster and it also allows me to put a lot more rub, making it much more flavorful and whenever you're cooking ribs and you don't have a lot of spaces this is the perfect method to use and of course the rest is just bone nothing else usually I use a binder of either mustard or Worcestershire sauce but today I want to make a little bit more flavorful so I threw in yellow mustard followed by hot sauce and of course a little bit of Worcestershire sauce now mix it well and my binding sauce is ready I'm hoping this makes an additional layer of flavor so to season the ribs I first started by brushing a thin coat I made sure that every single edge got some coating then I season it well with 
with salt and Google's rub. Remember, as I always say, you cannot buy this rub, but you can definitely make them at home. And if you have not seen that video where I show you how to make it, make sure you check it out in the description down below later on. Once I was done, you can see every single one of them is perfectly seasoned. And for this method, I'm also using the indirect heat. But at the same time, I did wanted some wood flavor. And if you've ever smoked anything before, you know moisture is extremely important. So once that half a can of Dr. Pepper was full, I started adding the ribs. To have a nice wood smoky flavor, I threw in some pellets. This should give me a wonderful wood taste, which we all love on ribs. Now there's left to do is to cover it up and control the heat to keep it at 275 degrees Fahrenheit for four hours. This is the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. Not only do you gotta keep an eye on it, you have to have an extreme amount of patience. It is also very difficult to do. But after four hours of watching this thing like a hawk, make sure it was at the right temperature and I had a consistent smoke, this is what I was left with. The nice mahogany color is a sign that it did get some smoke. But at the same time, this is not perfect. And the edges that were closest to the fire got a little burned. But that's totally okay with me. Now even though they have a nice smoke, they are not fully cooked cooked yet. I like it nice and tender. So for that, I decided to wrap them up in aluminum foil. Now you can use any type of liquid for this, but if you've never heard of Dr. Pepper ribs, you don't know what you're missing. So I went ahead and threw in half a can. Wrapped it up tightly and it was ready to go back into the grill. This time I really didn't care so much about the temperature. I could tell you one thing, it was probably about 300 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. But since there's a lot of liquid in there, aka Dr. Pepper, it should not exceed 225 degrees Fahrenheit. As it was cooking, I decided to make a nice barbecue sauce to go along with it. So into a saucepan I threw in 2 tablespoons of brown sugar, followed by 2 tablespoons of ketchup, 1 teaspoon of Dijon mustard, 1 teaspoon of sriracha hot sauce, and finished it up with Dr. Pepper. Now you want to let it simmer until it reduces to less than half. And once that's done, you are left with a beautiful barbecue sauce. By the time I was done, my ribs were ready. So I started by opening up the aluminum foil and as you can see, I was left with some beautiful ribs. Yes, even I am impressed with this one. But don't you think that this was easy? A tremendous amount of patience and work went into this one. And if there's one thing I've learned whenever I'm making barbecue is that you need to have a lot of patience. Make sure you do not throw the juices left on the aluminum foil. Baste the ribs as much as you want with it because that has a wonderful flavor. And of course, we cannot forget about that spicy Dr. Pepper barbecue sauce we just made. It has a wonderful flavor, but it also packs a punch. To show you that this was perfectly cooked, let me show you something. As you can see, it just completely comes off the bone. That is phenomenal. And if I jiggle the bone a little bit, there you go, completely off the bone, just the way I like it. But of course, I only make food to share. And here's what my nephew Angel had to say about it. It's like a sweet with a little bit of spice. Yep. I like that. That is amazing, everybody. Check it out. It falls apart, but not so much, and it's still nice, juicy, and tender. Yeah. That's what you want in a rib. It still has its bite. Oh, yeah. So, that's good. No more. I, gotta, I like it. I, got, I like it. I gotta share with the rest of the family. Jumping on to the next one and it is gonna be veal. By the time we are done with this one, you will know exactly what it tastes like. And this is flank steak veal. Unlike beef, the color is a lot lighter. And just like regular flank steak, it does not have a lot of fat. It is also very thin, so you know you gotta cook this nice, hot and fast. To season it, the first thing I like to do is to marinate it. That adds a lot more flavor and it's perfect for this cut. To make the marinade, I first started with a little bit of garlic. And when I say a little, I mean a lot. Then I squeezed in a whole juice of a lemon, followed by two tablespoons of soy sauce, three tablespoons of olive oil, half a tablespoon of sriracha, and one teaspoon of salt. Now all there's left to do is to mix it well and your marinade is ready. This one is nice and flavorful, but it is not spicy. But now that you saw how I made the marinade, make sure you massage that flank steak like there's no tomorrow. You want to make sure every single edge is coated. If you happen to happen a vacuum sealer, use it. Or better yet, a vacuum chamber does the job a lot better. You want to let this marinade for at least two hours. Or better yet, overnight. The the very next day, you want to remove it from the bag and get it ready for seasoning. Because remember, we did not add a lot of salt. So for that, I started with salt, followed by freshly ground black pepper. That will ensure me that every single steak is perfectly seasoned. As you already know, these steaks are extremely thin, we gotta go hot and fast. And that is exactly what I did. They took no time at all, I cooked them for only about 2 minutes per side. As they were cooking, I also basted them with butter. Because you already know that butter makes everything better. But once the internal temperature of 135 degrees for 
Fahrenheit was reached, I took them off. And this is what veal steaks cooked on a cheap grill looks like. Unlike beef, you do not get a very strong crust. That is also because of the marinating it made it very wet. But at the same time, you should not compromise any flavor. The one thing you never want to do with veal is to overcook it. So as I took my first slice, you can see that it was perfectly medium rare in the middle. That is exactly how you should cook veal. Because even though it does look like chicken, it is not. And the flavor is quite unique to describe. Because take a look at that, it looks like white meat. But hey, as always, the most important thing is the taste. Now, you ever to try it together? You ever had veal? Mm, never had veal. All right, first time. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Mmm. Well, it's definitely different from a regular steak. It has the steak flavors, but it doesn't have all of the steak flavors. Does that make sense? The charcoal flavor shows a little bit more. <laughs> you like that charcoal, huh? And I like the charcoal, so I can't complain, bro. That's my nephew. He liked the charcoal. Well, he's going for another one, so I guess you do like it. Uh-huh. Huh? <laughs> and that, friends, is how you cook veal. If you've never had this one, you have to try. And it is bone marrow. Yes, I know it's not meat, but let me tell you something. I gotta put this one on I cook every meat. Because as the saying goes, this is the butter of the gods. Once you had it, you always want more. And it's so easy to make. This is what it looks like raw. As you can see, the bone marrow has a lot of blood inside. You can cook it just as is. But at the same time, if you do it this way, you'll be very strong. So I always recommend to extract all of that blood and it is super simple to do and here's how start off with nice cold water and throw in a good amount of salt make sure it's completely dissolved in the water and you are ready for your brine add your bone marrows in there make sure it's completely submerged and let it sit in your refrigerator overnight because the very next day this is what it looks like as you can see they are as clean as it gets i would say the brine removed quite a bit but not all of it i only let it brine for 24 hours if you leave it for longer you can extract even more but hey 24 hours is good enough for me. Since they were in a salty solution, there's no need to add any salt. So I started with a little bit of freshly ground black pepper, followed by garlic powder. That is all the seasoning you need to make the butter of the gods. To cook them, you kind of want to roast them at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That will cook them nice and fast, but at the same time, you don't want them to be completely liquefied. As it was cooking, I decided to make a simple chimichurri sauce. So into the food processor, I threw in a little bit of basil, followed by a little bit of cilantro, parsley, and garlic. Blend everything on high and make sure everything is chopped up. Then throw in some shallots, followed by dry oregano, salt, freshly ground black pepper, tiny bit of cherry vinegar, and a good quality olive oil. Blend everything well and your chimichurri is almost ready. To finish it all up, I like to add a little bit of acidity with a lemon, mix it all well together, and your chimichurri sauce is done. That, friends, it's a wonderful sauce to go along with the bone marrow. Because the butter of the gods is so rich, this goes perfect with it. Talking about that, by this time, my bone marrows were ready. And that that is exactly what you're looking for. Roasted to perfection. And at the same time, it held its shape. The one thing you want to avoid is to have your grill so hot that it completely melts. Because I'm telling you, once you give this one a try, the last thing you want is to waste it. To eat it, I just recommend putting it on a piece of toast just like this. And as you can see, you use it just like butter. And it is like neat butter because as I went in for my first bite, <laughs> It is amazing, phenomenal. I cannot find enough words to describe how good this actually is. You will definitely thank me later. I just wish my nephew Angel was with me today. Because last time we had bone marrow together, we had a good old time. One thing you have to do if it's your first time trying it, you have to drink from it. That will create an incredible memory that you will never forget. There you go, my brother. How is it? Tastes like bourbon. <laughs> I don't taste anything else. Get it five. Good job for taking your first bone marrow shot. So as far as cooking a bone marrow on a cheap grill, this one was a hundred percent success. To really put the cheap grill to the test, I'm gonna be cooking a whole chicken. Yes, one full chicken to see how it cooks. But I'm not cooking a regular chicken you find on the supermarket. Check this one out. It is a special chicken. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I can tell you one thing: it does not have any feathers on its neck, and it was also air chilled, which to me is one of the most wonderful things you can do for poultry. And as I open up the packaging, this is what it looks like. It's not large by any means. I would say it's the same size as of a young chicken. To ensure that it's gonna fit and cook properly, I decided to spatchcock it. That is super easy to do. You just gotta get a kitchen sear and go to town on the back. Start by cutting one side and then the other. As you can see, you can completely remove the backbone. Now there's left to do is to open it up, cut the fatty part of you know what, and you have a perfectly spatched cock chicken. Do not be intimidated. This is as easy as you get. 
cuts. So I started by separating the skin from the meat. Make sure you get in there and separate as much as possible. Then you want to season everything well with salt. To do this with poultry is perfect because it will not only flavor the meat, but it will also dry up the skin to make it very crispy. Now there's left to do is to put it on a cooling rack and set it on my refrigerator overnight. And the very next day, once I pull it out of the refrigerator, this is what it looks like. As you can see, the skin is much drier and the dry brine did its job. Make sure you leave it on your refrigerator uncovered. Now, of course, all there's left to do is to season it with your favorite rub. I'm using Guga's rub, as you already know. Make sure you season it well. And as you already know, Guga's rub does not have a lot of salt, so it is perfect for dry brining. Because some of the rubs that you buy, they just have way too much salt and not enough seasoning. So that is why I always use Guga's rub. Now all there's left to do is to get our cooker ready. And for this one, I'm cooking it in indirect heat, but at the same time, nice and hot. I'm shooting my cooker to cook at indirect heat at 425 degrees Fahrenheit. That will cook it nice and fast, and at the same time, make the meat nice and juicy and the skin crispy. I let it cook until it reached an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit on the breast. And once that did happen, this is what I got. That is a perfectly cooked chicken on the cheapest grill you've ever seen in your life. Not only does it look good, it smells good. At the same time, it is one of the easiest thing to cook. But as always, you already know the most important thing is always the taste. So I started by removing both legs. And lastly but not least, the breast. Talking about that, you can see that it's nice and juicy. And it's still extremely hot. So today, my nephew Angel was here with me and we could not wait any longer. Oh, that is juicy. Mm -hmm. The flavor is like more intense than a regular chicken. And we'll go again. Wow, you're gonna go again for the chicken? <laughs> That's really good. That is a good chicken, everybody. Cooking a chicken on a cheap grill definitely worked. And that is all I have to say about that. Now let's talk about seafood, specifically salmon, one of my favorite fishes to eat. I started with two small pieces. The first thing I did is to put some rub on them. To make the rub is pretty simple. I got one tablespoon of brown sugar, followed by one teaspoon of lemon pepper, half a teaspoon of smoked paprika, and to finish it off, one teaspoon of salt. Mix it well and your rub is ready. As you can already tell, this one is gonna be kind of sweet. And I think it's the perfect combination for salmon. As always, whenever you're applying the rub, make sure you put it in all sides, including the edges. To make sure the fish will not stick to the grate, I used a little bit of parchment paper. To make it easy to transport it into the grill and out of the grill, I'm using a cooling rack. I set the grill to indirect heat, but at the same time, I wanted some smoky flavor, so I threw in a little bit of wood pellets. Added both of my salmon filet in there and let it cook. As that was happening, I decided to make a simple garlic glaze to go along with it. So in a saucepan, I threw in a little bit of balsamic vinegar, followed by soy sauce, ketchup mayonnaise, which is a sweet soy sauce, a little bit of honey, ginger paste, garlic paste, and of course, you're not gonna make a glaze without brown sugar. Mix everything well and let it reduce to half. Definitely keep an eye on this one so that it does not burn. Once the reduction has been achieved, your glaze is ready. This one, friends, is perfect to go along with any type of seafood, especially if you like it sweet. By this time, my salmon was fully cooked, which I was looking for an internal temperature of 145 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, to finish it off, we gotta go in with our glaze. And that is a salmon cooked on the cheapest grill ever. I mean, it does look good, but how does it taste? And as I took my first piece, this is what it looks like. Looks good. One thing left to do is to give it a try. And as I did, that's nice. It does have a smoky flavor. It is not the best salmon I ever had, but it's good. The sweetness of the sauce is a perfect combination. At the same time, the balsamic vinegar brings a nice acidity to it. And if you ask me if this was a success, yes, it was. Definitely give it a try to this salmon. You will not regret it. That is all the meat I currently have in my house. I cooked everything, everybody. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do enjoy it, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, be sure to subscribe for future videos. Remember, if you are interested in anything I use, everything is always in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you guys on the next one. Stay safe, keep cooking. If you keep cooking, I will. See you guys on the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.